So we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Kate Schlesinger, Retail Solutions Advisor for the Center for Professional Executive Development. I'm excited to have you here today with us as we're going to hear from my colleague, Scott Converse, and some of your industry professionals, Melinda Buffington and Krista Dalton. So before I get started and turn it off to Scott, I'd like to share a few words about our center and how we do things here. So the, the Center for Professional Executive Development, we call it CPED, that's way easier to say, offers programs and certificates that will give you that modern, relevant skills needed to advance your career. All of our programs offer interactive live learning sessions facilitate with instructors like Scott who really lean into the best practices that, that are in that topic area. We partner with organizations to provide customized professional solutions as well as coaching and consulting and all sorts of great things. So love for you to check out our website at uwcped.org to learn more. I also wanna cover a few logistics for today's session. So um, I know we can't all see you, you can see us, but we do have some functions at the bottom of your screen that really allow you to engage and work with us. There is a chat or question and answer button. Scott's gonna have you right out of the gate, engaged, doing polls and really interacting with this platform. Most of those functions you'll find along the bottom of the, of the screen there. So anytime that you need, my colleague Brooke is also on to be able to support us, but her and I will be man monitoring that chat and the QA buttons. Scott usually gives me full permission to interrupt him if necessary. <sighs> But we will likely save all of those questions until the end, unless there's something so critical. If you have any technical issues too, just reach out to CPED webinars and we'll be able to help you directly. And so now I wanna spend a couple minutes just introducing our instructors and panelists, presenters. So first you're gonna hear from Scott Converse. He is my colleague, an amazing CPED instructor and project management program director. He has more than a decade of applied experience in the field as a former information technology director, as well as a technologist for an inter internetworking software developer. Next is Melinda Buffington. She is actually like what a five time Badger alumni from CPED. So she is one of our fan favorites, but she's a project manager at Vortex Optics. She has spent the past six years working at Vortex in the IT department as a help desk supervisor, business analyst, and project and portfolio manager. Last but certainly not least is Krista Dalton from Tacobus. This is a luxury boot brand. So if you don't have them, you must check them out. She's their chief digital officer overseeing the company's e-commerce platform and digital marketing. Prior to joining Tacobus, Krista was the chief merchandising and customer officer at Overstock and also spent many years in merchandising at Target. So thank you all of our presenters and panelists for being here today. Scott, I'm gonna turn over to you to get us started. All right. Thanks so much, Kate, for that introduction. And thanks, everybody, for carving out this time period. I know you've all got a busy work week, and uh, I'm just so glad that we're all here getting, giving each other a chance to talk about process improvement. It's just core to my being, and gosh, I'm jazzed to get going. Um, but before I do, let me tell you a little bit more uh, about myself. I think that's going to help you with uh, where some of the content ideas come from, uh, as well as give you uh, maybe some insight into some of my biases. Um, as Kate had mentioned, I just want to make sure that my drawing pen works here. Yes, good. As Kate has mentioned, uh, uh, I oversee uh, our content areas of continuous improvement and project management. I spend a lot of my time in the classroom teaching to to business professionals like yourselves uh, on topics of process improvement and, and project management. Um, but uh, what I really love about my job is I also get to work with, gosh, there's nine, now, now 10 other instructors that are involved in these content areas. And I'm also um, required to be an active participant of process improvement uh, project work, you know, sometimes leading projects, uh, occasionally being a participant, frequently uh, advising others on their projects and, um, and reviewing uh, projects as part of certification activities. Um, gosh, I've been doing the teaching part of my job here for 
almost two decades now. This is my 19th year in the classroom, and I've been part of the campus community, the UW campus community now for, uh, well, since my daughter was born. Uh, she's 27, oh my gosh, 27 years. I've uh, been a part of uh, what makes Wisconsin red. Um, I guess where I'm going with this, the reason why I brought this up is um, with that data you just got, you now know I'm old. Uh, uh, my pop culture references are going to be outdated. My dad jokes are horrible. Uh, but uh, I've also seen uh, and, and logged a whole bunch of process improvement pro tips and experiences. And, and so part of, this, uh, part of this session is going to be the sharing of pro tips, things to do or not do to see successful process improvement project outcomes. Um, and, and in the classroom, I, I, I sometimes accentuate these pro tips uh, by sometimes bringing in a bullhorn or other times pounding my foot like a horse. It doesn't work in this type of uh, um, Zoom-like environment. So anytime I've got a pro tip today, uh, I'm going to go to an audit auditory way of getting your attention. I've got a xylophone right next to me. And anytime I've got a pro tip, anytime I've got a pro tip, I'll hit the xylophone. And uh, did anybody get a Mr. Rogers flashback when that occurred? Yeah, well, anyway, whatever. Um, all right, let's roll up our sleeves uh, and get to work here. Here we go. So uh, today's agenda, I want to spend a little bit of time taking a look at different approaches that you could consider for doing a process improvement project. Um, um, I want to take a look at four big process inefficiencies that uh, often occur in the workplace. Um, I, I'm also curious, or not curious, but I'm, uh, I'm I'm also excited about sharing uh, seven common process improvement traps that I see happen in, in project teams. But before we kind of dive into that content, you know a little bit about me, you know a little bit about what our panelists are and uh, where they come from, um, but we'd like to know a little bit about you. So I think Brooke, Brooke, are you out here right now? Uh, I've got three quick poll questions that I think are gonna help me tailor the content, but also help you better understand who makes up this big classroom that we're in. And so the first one is, um, tell me what industry sector best represents you. And this isn't an exam question, it's anonymous. Um, and, uh, and so make your responses quick. Uh, Brooke, you let us know when you feel like you've got enough responses here. Where are folks coming from industry sector wise? Awesome, thank you. So uh, as I expected, kind of spread out. Uh, I'm glad to see uh, we've got some folks from IT. It's kind of one of my areas. I know that uh, um, uh, Melinda's excited to see that, but healthcare and consumer st staples and uh, uh, as well as consumer discretionary played a big role. So thank you for that. Um, Brooke, let's take a look at our next question. All right, organizational function. Where, what do you, where, what role do you play in the organization? I love how other is chopped off on my screen. Yeah, there it is, other. And we'll wait for those responses. All right, Brooke, what have we got? Oh, lots of folks in ops as I kind of expected, but it's great to see the marketing and sales folks, human resources, uh, financials as well. Not a lot of quality folks or R&D, but that's fine. Um, and then finally, Brooke, uh, how about the one related to the process improvement project work that they do? Yeah, there we go. How much of your work time is spent in process improvement projects? How often are you doing this? All right. What have we got, Brooke? 
and the responses are in. So again, kind of what I expected, but I'm glad to see it. A uh, good quarter of the audience uh, practitioners that are that are doing this. And so I really encourage you practitioners, fire up your chat and provide some uh, additional context and feedback to some of the topics that we'll be covering in the agenda. And certainly for those of you that are, that are new or only occasionally involved in process improvement work, bring up that chat feature and start pounding out those questions that you have as I, as I present the topics uh, at hand. Thanks, Rick, for running the polls. Let's let's crush this agenda here. Here we go. Um, uh, and of course, Scott, in order to go to the next slide, you actually have to hit a button. There we go. What? One of, the, one of the reasons why I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about problem solving methodologies is because I find that when you're doing a process improvement project to try to make work better or to reduce frustration, which that is my definition of process improvement. You know, if you do a process improvement project well, you should reduce the frustrations that your folks within the organization are feeling. You should be reducing the frustrations that your end users or customers are feeling. And you should be making work better. Not perfect, but better. Um, any good process improvement project is about making work better or reducing frustration. Sometimes I find if a project didn't succeed, it wasn't because the individual didn't have skills or competencies or the team did a poor job or that the problem solving tools were ineffective. It was because the approach that they took wasn't well suited for the type of process problem that was happening. And so I wanna explore three different common approaches to take for process improvement problem solving. And the first one, uh, action or option-based problem solving, ironically, I learned um, in my first real job uh, when I was in high school and college, uh, I used to work in retail at a KB toy store uh, in the Wausau, Wisconsin mall. Hey, if you were ever uh, working retail in a mall anywhere in the world, let's hear about it in the chat. Um, but if you ever went to the Wausau mall and visited the KB toy store that I was at, I definitely want to hear about you. Um, in any case, uh, when I worked at this toy store, my, my manager, his name was Mark, uh, and the work group that we were a part of. It felt like uh, scenes from the TV show, The Office. You know, Mark, in many ways, he even looked like Michael Scott. We had, we had a Dwight. Um, there was a Stanley and an Oscar. <laughs> there was definitely a Toby. Um, oh, oh my gosh, um, even every now and then Pam uh, and Jim would pop in. There was even a sort of a love story theme that was going on at this toy store with, uh, with the Jim and Pam characters. Uh, Jan even popped in regionally and uh, checked on folks. It, it felt like the office in many ways. But um, uh, my, my boss, Mark, he even, had a, he even had a mug, and on the mug, it, it said world's greatest boss on it. Um, but on his back office door, uh, when you would go into the back office supply room area, he had a little office in there. On his door, he had a sign that said, walk in with problems, walk out with solutions. Mark was an action-based problem solver. Um, and I love action-based problem solving, and I wanna walk you through how action-based problem solving works and then compare and contrast it to a couple of other techniques next. So in an action or option-based approach at uh, working on process improvement, I'm, I'm gonna use the analogy that Mark gave me. Uh, I'm gonna use the analogy of the dartboard where your process problem is the, the bullseye of the dartboard. And in action-based problem solving, it's just a few steps uh, to perform action-based problem solving. In step one, the assumption is somebody has come to you with frustration. Could be a, a worker, uh, it could be a colleague, it could be an end user. Uh, there is some sort of frustration in the workplace or from end users, and they come to you with this problem that needs to be addressed. And in step one of action-based problem solving, you ask clarifying questions. Now, sometimes you're asking the questions because you're unfamiliar with the process, the process problem itself. Frequently though, you're asking these clarifying questions, not because you don't know about the problem, you've known about the problem for a long time. You're asking the questions to create a level, level playing field in terms of the knowledge about what's going on in current state. These questions are sometimes to help increase the knowledge of the folks that are coming into the room that you're gonna try to solve the problem. 
as you're asking these questions, in step two, we're gonna try to identify underlying issues. Now, academics call these underlying issues variables. And I like to use the analogy of the dartboard where the issues are variables. They're, they're like steps away from the dartboard that you are. And those little rounded humps that I just drew right there, those are like steps away from the dartboard. You know, one of the variables you might have with this poorly performing process is you've got a, a colleague or a coworker with a, a skill gap. Uh, or you've got a problem with an upstream supplier's quality of raw materials or products that you're working on. Or, or you've got uh, one of the issues is a struggle that you're having with one of the underlying uh, IT systems, the data repository warehouses that you're using to make decisions and, and fulfill service requests from. Each one of those would be an underlying issue or a variable. Each one of those is a step away from the dartboard. And the third step for action-based problem solving, once we've laid out what those issues are in this quick bursted meeting environment, you then identify solutions that might address these issues. The solution is gonna be this dart that I did not draw well, but pretend that that's a dart. And, and in the fourth step, the last step, it's all about implementation. You take that solution and you go out and implement it. And here's what we know, and we've done some research, some of it done in, within our own Wisconsin School of Business. High performers in the workplace, you are outstanding at implementation. And so you take that solution and you throw it at the bullseye, the business problem, and quite frequently you hit the bullseye, frustration has been reduced, work has been made better, the story ends and the upside, the frown goes upside down and folks are happy. But here's the thing, even if you don't hit the bullseye, let's say you throw this solution out and you implement it and you don't, it doesn't improve the current state. It doesn't address the underlying problem. You know, you hit the board or, or, or you miss the board altogether you've gained new knowledge. What you found out is that for one of these issues that you picked a solution for, it's not at the root of the problem. And so the next attempt, it's in essence fewer variables now that you have to work with. The next attempt, you're closer to the dartboard. We find that this action or option-based problem solving approach in after one, two attempts, you almost always are seeing some improvements. We love, I love action-based problem solving. It's quick and it's effective, but here's where it breaks down. It's great when you have only a few issues, only a few variables. You don't live in that world anymore. Here's what I mean. Uh, let me zoom out. You don't have three variables. You have, you don't have three workers. You have three different shifts of workers and they're across multiple geographic regions. And now let me zoom out further. You don't have, you don't have just uh, one or two supplier issues. You've got multiple supplier issues. You've got upstream, um, uh, upstream supplier issues, but you've also got multiple different types of customer complexity in the request. Some folks asking for simple requests, others asking for complex fulfillment, and others asking for extraordinarily complex, never been asked of the organization before type requests. And then for a few of you, oh my gosh, it's even more difficult because you've got the dilemma of outside, uh, you've got outside regulatory and compliance, local, state, federal, international laws that you have to live with and, and build into your process. And now you're trying to throw a dart from way across the room, heck, way across the uh, parking lot, heck, way across the county. It's an extraordinarily frustrating affair and you frequently miss after one, two, three attempts, you don't hit the board, and the whole organization looks at you as a high performer trying to make work better, and you go, man, our brightest and best tried, we spent time and resources on this process, and we got nowhere. Ugh, here's the problem with action-based problem solving is that it works really well when the type of process problem that you've got has only a few variables. You don't live in that world. 
you live in a world now where you've got those dozens and dozens of variables, and so you need an approach to help you with complex business problems. Now, complex business problem solving, another way of describing it, data-driven problem solving. We're gonna lean in heavily on using data to help with the analysis. But whether, whether the complex problem solving methodology uses the name Lean or Six Sigma or, or Plan, Do, Check, Act or Design Thinking or Agile or A3 Problem Solving or Kaizen or uh, um, 5S, oh my gosh, there, there are literally dozens of these complex problem solving approaches. They all involve the use of collecting data to better understand current state, using that data to get to the real root causes then using data to help with solution identification and evaluation, and then using data after the solution has been implemented for monitoring and, uh, 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 and uh, monitoring a future state. When we are using these complex problem solving approaches, they are typically best suited for either local work group processes. This is a process where all of the activities from beginning to end for fulfillment, for request fulfillment, for product development, for, for whatever the output is that you're creating in this process, all of those activities contain, are contained within one work group area. The, some of these problem solving methodologies, they work best for local work group processes. Other problem solving methodologies are best suited when you've got multiple work groups where the work that I perform in my functional area is passed off to another functional area and then to another. Sometimes they span the whole organization. Sometimes these processes not only span your organization but other organizations and then back to you. So occasionally we're looking at methodologies that help with enterprise-wide process problems. Regardless though, whether you're dealing with a local work group issue or you're dealing with an enterprise issue, there are four big inefficiencies that these data-driven approaches try to attack. Let's take a look at each one of them. Here we go. Four big inefficiencies, and let me center my screen. There we go. The first one, sometimes called lean waste identification, uh, I love this uh, visual, I, visually identifiable waste. You, you're going to have poorly performing processes that create inefficiencies, that create the frustration in the workplace or frustration for end users. And sometimes you can, through direct observation, see that inefficiency. So when you hear folks say, let's go to where the work is being performed, let's do a process walk, let's go to the Gemba or go uh, do a Gemba walk, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see where the inefficiencies are. Mark would take me to the aisles of the toy store right before Christmas and go, there is where our wastes are. Now, sometimes the, the walk that you're performing is not a physical walk, it's, a, it's a more of a digital walk where you're taking a look at the breadcrumb tree trails of an e-commerce website and seeing where folks are dropping off, or you're taking a look at where form submittal typically has mistakes or errors, there, whether it's physical or digital, you want to go to where the work is being performed and see the wastes in real time, visually identifiable waste. That's one of the four big inefficiencies that these different approaches will try to attack, reduce, and eliminate to help make work better and help reduce frustration. Sometimes though, it's less about what you can see. Sometimes we work in knowledge work environments and other types of environments where it's less about seeing the work and it's more about the mistakes that uh, create rework loops. You know, where I'm performing activities, I pass my work off to another process worker or another work group downstream, they perform activities and then we find a mistake and then this stuff is routed back to me. Oh, that's super frustrating. And it's also frustrating for the end user because of the time delays that are incorporated with it. And even worse, if that mistake misses uh, being identified within the org, and it's not until the end user or the customer sees the mistake, now you've got warranty repairs, you've got customer service call-in, tech support issues. Ah. Oh, super frustrating. Sometimes your poorly performing process is related to rework. This next one I'm gonna star. Idle time handoffs between groups. Now, this is usually not when you're dealing with local work group processes, processes contained within one work group area. This is typically an inefficiency that you see with multi work group environments or, or a process that spans the whole organization. And here's where I'm going with this. 
I'll perform my work in my work group and I'll perform my set of tasks related to this process in minutes and seconds. I'm using a stopwatch to measure the performance that my work group does. Then I pass that work downstream to another group that performs activities to create a more valuable product or a more, more thorough completion of a service request. And it takes them minutes and seconds. And then they pass it downstream minutes and seconds. But the handoffs in between, they're not measured in minutes and seconds. I perform my work, I pass it downstream, and I use a calendar to measure these idle time handoffs. So they're taking days or weeks, sometimes months before the downstream group works on it. Man, that's frustrating internally, and it's extremely frustrating for your end user. And then you tie it to rework loops where sometimes I hand things off and wait days and then more days, and then they find a mistake. It gets sent back to me, and we do this all over again, so it's like a double whammy. Ugh. Some of your complex problem solving methodologies are to deal with, first to identify, then to measure, and then come up with novel future state ways to reduce or eliminate those idle time handoffs between groups. Finally, process variation. Process variation can also be extremely inefficient that creates all sorts of frustration. And sometimes when we're talking about variation, we're talking about upstream variation. This is uh, where you've got different types of suppliers providing different levels of quality, um, or it could be upstream variation in the different types of customer requests that are coming in, where you have to build a process that not only handles the simple and the complex, but the extraordinarily complex customer requests. That can create inefficiencies. But sometimes it's not about upstream variation, it's about in-process variation. And what I mean, by in-process variation is you've got to establish standards for the way that work should be performed. But you have different individuals and different work groups within the organization that feel that the established standard is not truly correct. They all have their unique and different ways that they want to perform their work activities. It should all be done the same way, but everybody does it in a uniquely different way. That creates inefficiency, which leads to frustration, and it leads to uh, work not being better. But you can also have a third type of variation. We call it output variation. Output variation is where the, the product output or the service request output that you are supposed to be providing to your end users varies. You know, sometimes it's done quickly, other times it's extraordinarily long. Sometimes you're within the service level agreement that you've established with an end user, other times you missed it by a wide, by a wide margin. We talk about this in terms of output variation. Some of your complex problem solving methodologies are, are, are optimized to help with identifying and seeing that variation, reducing and eliminating. Other types of problem solving methodologies are about these idle time. And then, you know, occasionally it's visually identifiable waste is the way to go. And look, in some of your worst poorly performing processes, you've got, uh, you've got um, a combination of all four. All right, uh, I just got a little Zoom uh, nasty gram that said uh, my connection was a little unstable. We I know I'm a little you. unstable, but we lost uh, is... you for just a couple seconds, but you seem to be back now. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I, I'm frustrated by my internet service provider right now. Um, all right, good. We've uh, uh, we're back. Uh, we're good. I hope we didn't. I uh, hope I didn't lose you too much there. Four big inefficiencies. Let's take a look then at some of. If we, if we know that there are three different approaches at solving complex, or three different approaches at solving process problems, and that all of these methodologies or recipes are, are to better understand the four big inefficiencies that we just laid out. Let's talk about some of the traps that we typically see in uh, process improvement teams. And I'm gonna bring out my xylophone stick right now because I got a lot of pro tips coming up related to common traps. Here we go. My first pro tip, 
My first pro tip is about this thing called the working harder trap. And what I'm talking about in the working harder trap is the finger pointing that frequently happens when it comes to process improvement, where it's, it's not about me, it's not about my group, it's about all of these other groups upstream and down. And, and here's the thing about this, it's not a process problem, it's a, a people problem. If you tell high performers in the workplace that the way to see workplace frustration reduced and the way to make work better is by working harder, high performers in the workplace will do just that. They will, they will work harder, even in a poorly performing process with all of those inefficiencies that we talked about. And performance, if measured in a speedometer needle of performance, performance will go up but in the short term, it's not sustainable, this working harder trap. You can't continue to just work harder without identifying the real root cause and reducing or eliminating those root causes. The working harder trap is a quick way at not doing data-driven problem solving. You're basically saying there isn't a process problem. We just need people to work harder. Performance goes up in the short term, but then it drops right back down in the long term. And here's the thing, when you tell high performers to work hard for a short burst, they will. But if this is now the new norm, eventually those high performers, they leave. And then performance goes down to an even lower level. Watch out for the working harder trap. Just a, a simple way of saying this isn't a process problem. This is just a people problem. It's not. It's more than a people problem. It's, it's, it's those big four inefficiencies that are driving this. The next one, this what doesn't get measured trap. Uh, I want to call this one out. One of, the, one of the characteristics of poorly performing processes is that, is that we don't measure the frustration that's happening in current state. Now that's not to say that all processes aren't being measured. We often have terabytes of data, whether it's on uh, uh, cost metrics, financial metrics, uh, other types of performance metrics. You may have reams and reams of data, but frequently in a poorly performing process, the frustration itself isn't being measured. And you'll sometimes have team members go, well, if we don't have data on it, then we can't improve it. Uh-uh, don't let that, don't slip into that what doesn't get measured trap. Part of good complex problem solving is using the data that's available. And if the data isn't available, building quick and effective techniques to help to measure that frustration. The better versus perfect trap, oh, I blame Motorola on this one. And I'm not trying to throw Motorola under the bus. They did a lot of great work in the 80s. Heck, they're, in, they're one of the organizations that's associated with the term Six Sigma problem solving. And if you dig deep in the Wikipedia journal entries or you dive into your business stats class, yeah, Six Sigma level of performance is only three defects per million opportunities. It's a nearly perfect process. And that's a trap. It's not about making work perfect, it's about making work better. And sometimes it's about making work better iteratively and incrementally where performance gains are established, that becomes the new norm and now new performance gains occur. This quest for perfection can lead to analysis paralysis and the old cliche, perfect is the enemy, a very good really does play a role here. Uh, don't let perfect be the enemy, don't slip into that better versus perfect trap. Uh, this next one was one that I frequently saw from camera, uh, from, from Mark, my boss at KB. And then when I worked in the software industry, some of you know from my classes, if you were an attendee, that I had a, a pretty crusty boss in the software industry named Cameron. And they frequently slipped into this, this uh, current, state, current state assumptions trap. They weren't close to where the work was. They were... They were multiple levels above where the work was happening. And, and their assumption about what was happening in the workplace was not a real reflection of current state. But they would take their assumptions and then build solutions from those incorrect current state assumptions. Part of good data-driven problem solving is to validate what really is going on in current state. Go to where the work is to do visual, uh, visual observation, collect, uh, relevant data that reflects what's happening now, not what's happening, what happened five years ago or 10 years ago when we had a lot of this easy to access data. Make sure that you have a clear understanding of what's going on in current state. 
you use then that current state data to get to the real root causes. Don't make assumptions about what's happening. That's your current state assumptions trap. Uh, the qualitative quantitative trap is something that I see from process improvement specialists that have gone through some of our technical training and ask questions about, Scott, should I be focused on the qualitative data collection? And qualitative data is about understanding what's going on in current state through interviews and stories and through direct observation. And I love qualitative data collection. Quantitative data is about the numbers. It's about the database queries. It's about the spreadsheet analysis. And sometimes it's about the real-time collection of the quant data when you have process workers tick and tallying or writing in their time in, time outs on a, on a, a pretty uh, simple form collection tool. It's not which one is better. It's the combination of both. We almost always recommend that you wanna start with qualitative data, especially with immature processes where you're not really measuring the frustration. Get those stories, get that anecdotal feedback, and then use the quant data to help validate what was heard or use that quant data to refute what was heard. Because sometimes when you ask people, tell me what's broken in current state, they slip into a recallability trap where they, they tell you about the one time that the process broke down and they forget to describe the 9,999 other times where it was successful. So watch out for that. You wanna use both when you're doing effective process improvement project work. I'm gonna star this next one, this uh, valuable variation trap, because this is especially important for you folks in the retail area. And that, actually, important also for you folks in healthcare, important for any uh, organization in which your unit of production is not a piece of steel that you're turning into an automobile, where your unit of production is a human being. You know, Toyota uh, was, is, is an organization famously known for quality improvement. They've done a lot of great things, and we talk about them in classes and their approaches and techniques a lot. But one of the ways that Toyota became a, uh, known in quality circles uh, as being a really effective organization is they would limit variation upstream by saying, look, you're not gonna to get to choose between 5,000 different car variations. For the, your Toyota Camry, you get the good, better, or best with these set features in good, better, or best. You don't get 10,000 different choices. They didn't, they didn't rely on hundreds and thousands of suppliers. They limited that upstream variation. But when you're dealing with humans, you can't always shut the door. Like you can't say, um, our, our emergency room is only going to take in folks with broken legs and not people with the flu or with heart ailments. You can't always tell your customers, you don't get to choose from all of the product offerings. You don't get to make that type of work request. You have to deal with the upstream variation. And so frequently in, in retail environments and in environments where you've got humans as the unit of production, you have to build robust, future state processes that work well with that upstream variation. You can't get rid of it. You embrace it and then build processes that are strong to support it. Finally, uh, I'm gonna double star. I'm gonna hit the xylophone. I'm gonna do everything I can to remind you that maybe the most important piece to process improvement success is understanding the role that buy-in plays. All data-driven problem-solving methodologies, they are going to give you technically robust solutions that attack root causes. But they're almost always going to change the way that work is being performed. You're going from a current state that's frustrating to a future state that's better. Something has to change. Work is frequently what's going to change. And I'm cool when other people have to change their work. But if I've been working and been successful in my work, that's gonna be a difficult pill for me to swallow to say, Scott, suddenly you have to change the way your work's being performed. Even if you say there's a lot of frustration and this is gonna help end users. Hey, I've been successful. I've adapted to the frustrations of current state. It's tough for some folks to wanna to buy into future state changes. 
part of an effective process improvement project is figuring out ways to create change readiness to increase that user acceptance and buy into those eventual future state solutions. It's as important as the data-driven problem solving. In many ways, it's more important than the data-driven problem solving. You've got to build into your process improvement teams and projects ways to better manage change, better prepare folks for change readiness and increase user acceptance and buy-in. Oh, seven big ones right there. Um, that was a lot in a short period of time. We've covered, we've covered three different problem solving methodologies. We've covered seven common process improvement project traps. There's been a lot of xylophone ringing and dinging along the way. It's time for me to t finally take a breath grab some water. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to pass the baton off to our panelists, to, to Melinda and Krista. And I know I've got Kate in here to also help manage the conversations that they're going to have around their own experiences in the retail industry and process improvement. Let me zip it. Uh, I'll be behind the scenes taking a look at some of the chat questions and we'll all be back together for the final Q&A. But let, let me pass the baton over to Kate, Melinda, and Krista. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. There is a burning question I think we're all wondering. Did all of your earnings at the KB store, toy store, go to the Aladdin Arcade and Orange Julius? <laughs> yes. So you Somebody have a, you have a Wausau fan. Someone knows the Wausau Mall. <laughs> I loved my strawberry Juliuses. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And uh, and it was um, I think it was it was Galaga where I spent all of my Aladdin token dollars on. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. All right. Wow. Well, thank you, Scott, and and welcome, Melinda and Krista. As we kick off this panel, I just want to I think the the audience just wants to hear just a little bit of your background. I give a very high level bio, but Melinda, let's kick off with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your role and maybe how process improvement plays a big part of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm not a five time, but I am a three time oh, alumni yes. <laughs> at CPED. Um, so I do have certifications in business analysis, uh, project management, and then um, advanced management and leadership, uh, along with also 15 years in the information technology uh, department. So um, I did receive my yellow belt from UW uh, in Lean Six Sigma. Uh, so that's actually kind come in very handy with a bunch of the process improvement projects that we've worked on here at Vortex. Um, so again, I was at Vortex or I've been at Vortex for six years um, and I've seen a lot of things come through. Um, and so yes, uh, using those roles, um, I've definitely have worked with a lot of business sponsors and worked on getting a bunch of our processes improved. Perfect. Thank you, Melinda. We'll get to some questions in just a minute. But first, Krista, maybe just give that same bit of background about yourself and how process improvement plays a role in your everyday life. Yes. So, hi, I'm Krista Dalton. I am the Chief Digital Officer at Tacovis Boots. Um, but previous to this, I was the Chief Merchandising and Customer Officer at Overstock.com, which is now beyond. And previous to that, I worked at Target Corporation, um, where I helped merge uh, stores and .com actually in one of the biggest process changes uh, that I've ever been through. And in the past seven years, and I realized this listening to you, Scott, I have a ton of experience as a chief, having the people come to me with problems and then trusting them and that I, I can't even tell you how many parts I put by that currency bias um, because uh, we called it knowing just enough to be dangerous where we were like, that's not how that works. And we weren't doing the work anymore. And so I got very used to doing the buy-in from the top down version. Um, but this also reminded me of how difficult it was when I was a director, really getting buy-in from above um, and helping them understand why we needed to make the changes we did, especially when we were merging stores and .com uh, because it was a large company doing really well. And they were like, we're good the way we are. And they helping them understand the future of where we were heading was was incredibly challenging. So this was really enlightening for me and I really enjoyed it. Perfect. Thank you. We are getting several questions in on the QA. Don't forget you can also use the chat to ask really relevant questions like Orange Julius, but also <laughs> there were some great comments in there as well. So um 
Melinda, let's start with you. Maybe you could just share some specific examples of how you have used process improvement to make work better, to reduce frustration, you know, help help meet performance targets your organization. Yeah, yeah. So actually, um, Scott hit on one of the four or one of the um, four properly or poorly performing processes, and that was actually one of the ones that we had to change. Um, so back in 2022, uh, summer of 2022, we actually went live with a new warehouse. Um, we outgrew the current one that we're in right now, um, and we moved our repair teams over to the warehouse um, during the summer 2022 as well. Um, while doing that, we still kept up with the current process that we had in the main building. Um, but unfortunately, that process wasn't reflecting the new locations that these uh, repair teams were in. Um, so unfortunately, what we're doing then is we're having a lot of touch points that didn't occur before in the main building. Um, so it's 12 points actually to be exact um, because we did process map it all out to see where these wastes and things were happening. Um, so we did notice that there was a lot of transferring of the product between the multiple floors that these teams were on. So we decided, okay, let's just go ahead and take somebody from the warranty team, put them directly into those repair teams. Uh, so we eliminated that waste of multiple products moving in different departments um, but also eliminating those touch points by uh, 50%. So it's it's actually been able, uh, really nice for us to be able to do these things because now it's helped with the turnaround time for getting our product back to the customer sooner. And again, like I said, reducing that, that those physical touch points. Awesome. Big. Yeah. <laughs> right? Big. It's, it's all the behind the scenes stuff. I just love it when we have the product, right? You don't think of all the behind the scenes stuff. Right. So, Chris, I, I know you, I know you referenced Oh, the... we're moving. And then... <laughs> right. right? Oh, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> right. Chris, so you referenced in your introduction a little bit of, of the platform, but do you have, maybe share another example or a more elaborate description of that yeah. example that, that, that worked for you in the past? Yeah. And Melinda, I identify so hard with what you just described, by the way, before I got into my example, we had over 5,000 vendors at Overstock and our biggest one, Ashley Furniture, had parts in three different warehouses. So when you had to replenish an item, you had to figure out which of the three warehouses had like part D to replace like the missing screw for a, a chair. And the behind the scenes data connectivity was so complicated. So it's like the shell game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, for me, you know, the the process improvement piece, I took over the, the customer service team um, and I'd never run customer service before. It was a team of 800 at the time, took it over in uh, Q4 of 2019. So in Q1 of 2020, uh, something happened that caused e-commerce to double overnight. And so on March 15th, when we had 300% increase in sales, I did not have 300% increase in customer service agent. Um, but I did have about a thousand percent increase in customer contacts because FedEx and UPS couldn't keep up with demand either. And I'm sorry, I'm not being opaque for a reason. I mean, COVID happened. People were suddenly working from home. They needed desks. They needed the things we supplied. A lot of elastics um, as well for making masks. And we did not have the capability of keeping up with what was happening. And so it was one of those times when a complex problem crashed in on us. It affected every team. It affected every customer. Um, transparently, I did get a couple death threats. Um, you know, people really wanted their couches on time. But uh, it was a very stressful time period. And so working with the tech team, working with the team, we we sat down and carved out four hours, which felt impossible to say, what are the biggest levers we could move to actually make customer experience better and decided on automation. Number one thing was self-service. We found out 30% of people when they were on the phone and they were told they could close an issue themselves would leave the phone call to go do it themselves. They're like, great, I don't want to talk to you and go handle that. Um, so we spun up a amazing tech team and product team who put together self-service returns, self-service cancellations. 
Um, and that actually changed. Uh, it was about 40% of our total contacts at that time were for those two reasons. So it was helping reduce the workload that hit the people because we there were not enough overtime hours in the world to handle what we were dealing with. Wow. Wow, that's, I mean, it, and, and the pressure, right? And and the emotions, I think that goes to, to Scott's mentioned the, the variable, but when you're dealing with the humans, right? It's like. Yeah, hard. well, and plus everyone was working from home. For the first time ever so yeah. there was that added variable there was how do we how do we hold people accountable to their metrics when they're from home how do we or do our kpis need to change and so dealing with all of that in addition to this really having to splice out the problem was incredibly important oh absolutely so you like raise a good question krista so let's actually pivot to melinda then back over to you what are some of those specific retail business metrics that process improvement projects have helped to improve? Things that you're actually measuring and you can kind of point to them. Yeah, so like our um, our marketing team, um, we actually wanted to try and reach out and get like a larger uh, base for our customers. Um, so e every year we always send out or we, provide a catalog for um, all of our um, for all of our customers to look at any new products that are coming out, um, new apparel. We have a couple of promotional things in there like stickers. Um, we do like background uh, stories for the employees to kind of create a rare experience for the um, for our customers. Um, and then so this year, like I said, we wanted to try something out a little differently um, and we wanted to reach a larger scale of people. Um, last year it was 2000 catalogs that we we ended up um, reaching out to. So we were kind of looking to hit at least just doubling that. Um, so we made a couple of changes of the way that we do the process for um, our customers to request a catalog. Uh, before we used to use our contact us form uh, or our contact us page. The problem with that is, is we have multiple forms that the end user can fill out um, on the contact us page. So so um, we're actually kind of pushing it toward the customer to click and look and figure out which form it is, click on it, fill out all their information. Um, so this year, we kind of changed it up and decided to use a Insta page um, instead of going through that um, page that we have on our website. Um, and actually, the, the nice thing about it is, is it was just a page, the end user could click on it, and it streamlined us collecting that person person's information, um, and then it would direct that information back into our system so then we could get that catalog out to them. Um, so again, like I said, back in 2023, we had 2,000 um, of these requests. Uh, we just implemented this new Insta page instead, um, starting the beginning of 2024, and we've actually reached 8,000 requests now <laughs> just by changing up this one little feature. And so, yeah, that, that was a uh, the 300% increase, which was just insane to us. So um, luckily we did uh, kind of give our warehouse team a heads up and let them know that this was going to be coming their way. Um, so they went ahead and started um, packaging up a bunch of the catalogs already. So then all the uh, bags were set and ready to go. So once those pro those orders actually went through and processed, they could just get them right out the door for the user. So so yeah, definitely a big yeah. change, <laughs> not something we were expecting either. Um, but yes, it, that was probably um, one of our biggest ones here for the year so far. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Krista, how about you? Um, you know, when I, I think about the biggest process uh, changes that come to mind, I stood up an organization of 190 people. Uh, it was a brand new organization and it meant everybody's job titles changed. Huge change management moment. Um, making sure that our top line sales and conversion were there. It was called the vendor management team. And their job was to onboard new vendors, drive sales, bring in new product. And that was totally different than what they were kind of doing before, which was it, it was assortment based, but um, with that change, getting the buy-in from the entire team and organization was incredibly important. And something I learned was, you know, setting the vision for where we're going. Um, somebody once told me 
when you're when you want to take people to Italy, you don't send them the map quest directions. You send them a picture <laughs> of like a Venice bridge um, and helping them understand why we made the change, where it was going. And then there were five main um, methods of getting people on board was like, what was going to benefit them personally, they were going to make more money, what was going to benefit the company, more focus on the vendors, so the company was going to grow, um, focus on global impact. There were, and we walked through them all because everybody's motivated by different things. Uh, but at the end of the day, KPIs and helping them understand like, hey, this is still the metric of success that we're, that we're driving towards was very, very important. But that came way after the like, get them excited moment. <laughs> Um, and in the end, they were they were pretty jazzed about the idea of many of them were excited about creating a new organization and making it their own. Excellent. Excellent. I am totally stealing that um, uh, Italy Venice Bridge story. That's, oh, I uh, love it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Awesome. Um, before we open it up, there are several key questions that are coming in from the audience. So before we go to that Q and A. Um, Scott, if you just want to move forward, I just want to let you know that Scott and I and the rest of our CPED team is here to be able to help you with whatever process improvement journey you are all on. We are getting so many great comments in the chat and a lot of behind the scenes questions. I'm hoping we're going to be able to get to most of them. Um, but my email is here on the slide. Please don't hesitate to reach out. You will be receiving, as a reminder, you're going to receive this recording. So if there are questions that I have in here that we do not get time because we have this goes so fast, five minutes left. Um, we will send that out to all the participants and all the people that registered that you can share. And hopefully if your question is not answered live now, um, we're asking Krista and Melinda also to answer these questions and then they can write it out and there'll be a longer, more formal answer as well. So um, with that, I wanna just open up to that first question. This could be to Krista, Scott or Melinda, whoever wants to grab it. Oh no, it just went down. Hold on. Okay, back, sorry. Based on your experience with process improvement initiatives, what are approaches that have proven successful in overcoming any resistance to process change that may have lessened the positive outcomes? I'll, um, I'll start real quick. Um, one, one of the techniques that I've seen uh, and used effectively is to realize that sometimes you're process improvement curmudgeon, um, the change resistor, uh, the no-no in the organization is not somebody that's resistant to change. They're, they've been burned in the past. They, they, they've been part of a past initiative that's failed, whether it was because of some of the traps we talked about earlier or in an inappropriate uh, methodology uh, uh, not chosen for the particular type of process problem. The curmudgeon sometimes is resisting the change because they're concerned about the uh, uh, not only what will happen to them, but they don't want to see the team fail. They don't want to see the organization fail. And so sometimes realizing that and and incorporating uh, uh, the devil's advocate curmudgeon into a process improvement team can sometimes help. You don't want the whole team to be made up of curmudgeons, but uh, sometimes Sometimes it's nice to have a, a realist, the devil's advocate uh, in the room as you're doing your problem solving. That is so true. And the, and the thing that I found most helpful is um, finding the person at all who is the influencer of their peers. And it's not always the person you think it is. It is not always the manager. Sometimes it's the person who, hang, well, I'm going to say hangs out at the water cooler, but I mean, the person who runs the Slack channel, the one who is mm -hmm. the most involved, sometimes bringing them on board early and saying, hey, listen, I need your thoughts. The person you know will be the curmudgeon and saying, confidentially, here's the vision, help me understand and getting them on board. So they're greenlit before everyone else. So when they go to them and people are saying like, hey, what do you think about this? They're saying, hey, I'm on board and here's why. So yeah. that pre-read to an influential person is incredibly important to me. We talk about it being a, a, a cross-functional coalition in your process improvement team. You don't want just your face, you want the faces of others that increases the trust that, uh, that the whole organization will have. 
Yep, yep. And then making sure that that person's voice is heard is is a lot of the problems that you know we run into here. Is just they they don't think that they're being heard and that their opinion isn't mattering. So that that's a lot of the things that we run into. So I, I, it's a super good tie in, Melinda, to to why we frequently look at qualitative data first because not only is it an effective. Uh, data collection technique for understanding current state, but it's a way to increase user acceptance and buy-in. Yeah, voices are being heard as one of those first steps then. Yeah. Right. Scott's always said there's that P in project management is really about people management too, right? I heard you say that. <laughs> so last question, we have just about a minute left. What's the best way to train out a new process to multiple branches with several different skill sets, longevity and buy-in? Is there a rule of thumb on what content to create based on to approve videos or documentation, in-person, SOPs? Like, what's the best way to train out a new process? Maybe Scott, um, that one. Oh, I was Linda, say, go ahead. No. From my, um, especially coming from like the IT side of things, because we have to do a lot of training on like the systems, how it works, that kind of stuff. I do it all. I do the videos. I do the SOPs. I do the documentation. And then just making sure that all that stuff is located in a centralized knowledge base or SharePoint or some spot where everybody can reference that stuff later is, is really a, a game changer. Um, that way, then, if you have any new hires that come in, there, they can go ahead, reference that site, look at everything and say, okay, here's the things that I need to do. I shouldn't be going off and changing and making my own process because this is the process I'm supposed to be taking. Iterative, incremental, pictures over words. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. I can't believe it's already two o'clock central. This went so fast. You guys were amazing. Scott, Melinda, Krista, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your expertise, keeping all of us consumers where we need to be, getting the products we want <laughs> when we want them. Um, for all of you, this will be recorded and sent out to you. Thank you for sharing part of your day with us and on this journey for continuous improvement. So thank you. Have a great day.